Hi friends, I'm Elise and welcome to my first ever YouTube video. I'm a sociologist and I create travel, society, and culture content. This video is a complete guide on how to visit Big Island efficiently, hit most of the major attractions in one week, and what to expect at each destination. I'll also discuss what hotels I would recommend on every budget. Even if you plan on visiting Big Island for less than a week, I think you'll still find the guide helpful. And at the end of the video, I'll tell you how you can find a downloadable itinerary with maps, which will make your trip planning much easier. If you enjoy this video, be sure to give me a thumbs up. And if you're interested in travel and culture content, be sure to hit subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. I also want to preface by saying that I do not speak Hawaiian, but I will do my absolute best to pronounce Hawaiian words correctly. And I apologize for any mispronunciations. Okay, let's get started. Day one, arrival. There's two ways you can go with your big island visit. You can either fly into Kona International Airport or Hilo International Airport. Originally, I flew into Hilo and spent a few days there before changing hotels and spending the remainder of my trip in Kona. Personally, I would not do this again. Tip number one, just fly into Kona directly and visit Hilo later. If you're interested in more about the Hilo side of the island and how I spent my time on the island, check out my other YouTube video, My Six Days on Big Island, which we'll post after this. There are many flight options to the Big Island, including inter-island flights from other Hawaiian islands. When I visited, inter-island flights were leaving about every hour from Oahu. The outdoor airport is relatively easy to navigate and baggage claim is just a short walk away at Terminal 1. There's a lot of nice hotels in Kona. Some of my favorites are the Four Seasons, Manolani, Ocean Tower by Hilton, and the Waikola Beach Marriott Resort and Spa. So let's first talk about hotels and my suggestions for all budgets. If you're looking for Hilton hotels in the Kona area, you'll notice there are about seven hotels. Hilton does this quite a lot where they'll have multiple hotels in the same area and many are a part of their Hilton village. Kohala Suites by Hilton Grand Vacation and Kingsland by Hilton Grand Vacations are a three minute drive down the street from the Hilton Village area. Directly in the Hilton Village, there's the Hilton Waikola Village, the Palace Tower, Ocean Tower by Hilton Grand Vacations, and the Ocean Tower at Hilton Waikola Village. The Palace Tower is at the heart of the village. There's a garden and a large fountain inside, but it's too dated for me personally. The Hilton Waikola Village is a little better, but it's still outdated. Now here's why there are two Ocean Towers. One is a timeshare and one is the hotel. The Ocean Tower at Hilton Rooms are undergoing renovations right now. They look pretty good. When I stopped by the reception desk, I asked how I can make sure that I get a renovated room until all the renovations are complete. And I was told by the receptionist that the renovated rooms have a kitchen in the description when you book, whereas the non-renovated rooms do not have a kitchen. Of all the Hilton hotels available, I would choose the renovated Ocean Tower. As of this video, the price ranges from about $200 to $250 per night. Inside the village, you can take a train or a ferry to get around easier for free. There are a lot of pools, restaurants, and amenities available. And if you're staying here, make sure you stop and enjoy a hammock by the ocean overlooking the Buddha statue. It is a beautiful area. And if you're looking to put a dent in your credit card, you can get a full-size pizza for $60 on site. Has anyone had their pizza? If you have, let me know in the comments if it's that good. Moving on. The Waikola Beach Marriott Resort and Spa has both a timeshare and a hotel option available. This hotel is a little more expensive than the Hilton option. The grounds are really nice. There are multiple pools and hot tubs available. There are fish ponds behind the hotel and there is direct access to the beach. If you're staying in a timeshare, it was called the Vacation Club, you'll have access to barbecues on site, although I guess anyone could use them. My partner Bjorn and I decided to stay a little longer on the island at the last minute and the only hotel available that we liked was a Waikola Beach Marriott timeshare. The room was really nice. It had a full living room, a kitchen, two balconies, and we were also able to order upgraded amenities, which the front desk said is not available on the hotel side. As of this video, the room rate averaged about 750 per night, but we were able to get a promotion, so it made the nightly average a little cheaper. The Four Seasons and Mauna Lani are the most expensive of my suggestions. Of this list, Mauna Lani is the farthest north it's a five-star hotel with an upscale spa. It has two golf courses. They also have two options for rooms available, the hotel side and the residence side. The hotel rooms each come with a balcony of which you can get a mountain or an ocean view. The residents are private bungalows. They come with a full kitchen, private pool, and sleep up to six. When I checked on rates, as of this video, hotel rooms averaged about $1,000 a night. And finally, the Four Seasons. 
The Four Seasons is the closest to Kona. The resort is absolutely beautiful, but it will set you back on average over $1,500 a night per standard room. The hotel has direct access to what is called North Beach and Kukio Beach, which I'll talk more about later in this video. The beaches are beautiful and were hands down my favorite beaches on the Big Island. Now that we've talked about where to sleep, let's move on to transportation. I would highly suggest that you look into renting a car for the duration of your stay. And if you do, you should look into renting a car in advance. Enterprise told me that they already have reservations for a year in advance. As of this video, the options for car rentals in Kona include Alamo, Avis, Budget, Dollar, Enterprise, Hertz, National, and Thrifty. I chose Enterprise because I've never had a bad experience with the company. It's easy to rent their cars and the employees are always very friendly. When it comes to selecting a car, whether you need an SUV or four x four is up to you. I rented a regular sedan because the lease agreement doesn't allow you to go off road or the top of Mauna Kea Observatory anyway. Getting to the car rental area is straightforward. When you arrive at the airport, you just take a shuttle bus to the car rental area, which is a few minutes down the street. The shuttle bus picks up passengers from across the baggage claim area. Tip number two, if you can't find a rental car, believe it or not, some people actually resort to renting U-Hauls. I saw quite a few people renting U-Hauls on my trip. Tip number three, if you're going the Gila route and then Kona like I did, I almost got charged over $1,000 to drop my car off at a different location. Check out my blog post on EliseLiola.com if you need more information about this, the link will be in the description. Some hotels offer a shuttle service, but because of the need to get around the island, I would always personally recommend getting a rental car. An Uber for this is kind of out of the question, and just getting around Kona in a rideshare isn't always an option, and you can basically forget about Uber Eats. There were few options and long delivery times when I tried ordering takeout twice. So now that we've discussed getting into Kona, where you'll sleep, and how you'll get around, let's dive into the best part, the adventures. Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and Mauna Kea. I was really excited to visit the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. I had wanted to see a volcano since I was a teenager and was so happy that I could finally check that off my bucket list. Weather permitting, and if you're not too tired from your travels, I would start with this and then hit up Mauna Kea Observatory at night on your way back. The Hawaii Volcanoes National Park is located in the Southeast. It takes about two hours from the resort area to get there without any stops. You can buy a seven day pass for $30 that's good at other US national parks. So if you're planning to visit visit Maui or any other national parks on your trip, you'll save money with this option. You can also pick up an $80 interagency annual pass, which is what I did. Make sure you bring warm clothes because it can get pretty cold up on the mountain and it will likely rain a lot. So bring a rain jacket or umbrella. It took about five hours to get through the park and this was without any hikes. I stopped at almost all of the sites with the exception of some of the smaller craters along the train of craters road. Start with exploring the summit of Kilauea outside the visitor center tour the right. When you're done, stop by the Halimau Mou Crater, the steam vents, and then the sulfur banks. Note that the park warns visitors to be careful about the fumes as they are hazardous. Afterward, I headed over to the Thurston Lava Tube. The lights do get cut at 8 p.m. So if you arrive late or if you're trying to hit it on your way back, you will need a flashlight. Also, mind the ninis. There are nini crossing signs everywhere. They're official state bird of Hawaii. They're endangered and they were literally just waddle right into the road. From there, I explored the Mauna Ubu lava flows from 1969 to 1974. There's also a nice overlook here and you can hike in this area, but it takes three to five hours one way and you'll have to bring additional supplies because of the elemental exposure and the time. From here, you'll drive down to the Puna Coast Trail where there's some additional parking. Due to closures from the 2018 volcanic eruptions, you can't get much farther than the Hole Sea Arch. So once you're done kind of exploring the area at the bottom, you'll have to turn around and head back up the mountain to exit. I was pretty hungry after exploring the park for five hours. And since you're gonna go through Hilo, I would recommend either stopping at Sweet Cane Cafe or Hawaiian Style Cafe, depending on your mood and what your estimated time of arrival will be in Hilo. Sweet Cane Cafe offers organic health food and Hawaiian style cafe has a lot of Hawaiian options. If you stop at Hawaiian style cafe, you can get a mixed plate to try a few of the Hawaiian options and get a homemade little koi pie if you're really wanting to splurge. It's actually really good. Sweet King Cafe stays open till about four, but Hawaiian style cafe stays open till nine on some nights. Make sure you check the operating hours at the beginning of the day. On your way back to Kona and if it's night, you can stop by the Mauna Kea Observatory. Make sure that you plan this well so that you can stargaze without moonlight of in your view. When I visited, moonrise wasn't until nearly midnight. 
timeanddate.com has a pretty good chart for moonrise and moon set, and some people also try to plan their trip around the new moon. You'll need very warm clothes for Mauna Kea. I had fleece pants, a winter hat, long sleeve shirt, and I was still very cold. It'll take you a good hour and a half to get back to the resort in Kona after you're stargazing. Day three, Punalu, Papakolea, and Kalea. If you didn't have breakfast at Island Vintage Coffee yet, and if they've opened as of this video on Big Island, I would highly recommend going here for breakfast. I I think I could eat here every single day and never get tired of it. I love their acai bowls and their smoked ahi sandwiches, basically everything on the menu. When it comes to planning on this day, it really does not matter which order you visit the sites. They're all located in the southern part of the island. Punalu'u is a rare black sand beach. Papakolea is one of only four green sand beaches in the world, and Kalea is the southernmost point of the entire United States. Key West is the continental. Parking is easy at Punalu'u and Kalea, but Papakolea requires a hike. Kalea and Papakolea are right next to each other, and Punalu'u is the farthest away. Personally, I go to Papakolea, Kalea, and then hit up Punalu'u on the way back to relax. To get to Papakolea and Kalea, you'll need to drive through miles of cow forms before getting to a little dirt road. Parking here is free, but be mindful of the restricted areas near the parking because there is a native burial site right by. So let's talk about Papakolea and the hike to the green sand beach. It's the rarest beach type that comes with some problems. The beach is free as all Hawaiian beaches are free for public use. However, you cannot legally take your rental car off the road and the shuttle service that is often here is illegal. Some people try to offer you to drive you for cash, so you'll either need to break rules or hike. The hike is two and a half miles one way. Many people go cliff diving at Kalea, also known as South Point. There's even a ladder to climb back up, but it's quite the jump. There's also an underwater cave that people enjoy swimming into. Punalu'u Black Sand Beach is only about 45 minutes away from Kalea. There are often sea turtles here that you can observe, and there aren't that many black sand beaches in the world. If you haven't ever seen a black sand beach, I would recommend stopping here before you head back to Kona. The beach has restrooms, a snack bar, a picnic area, and there is direct street parking that is free. For eats, I would recommend stopping at Shaka Tacos about halfway from the hotel to South Point or at Umake's Fish Market in Kona. A notable mission is if you're wanting something sweet or pick me up or local artwork, stop at the Puna Chocolate Company near Umake's. Day four, Pu'uhu Nua'o Ha Now Now and Ho Now Now Bay. I always get excited to snorkel. I thought I had planned snorkeling at Ho Now Now Bay well, but I should have known better. If you pick up the National Park Pass, you can use it to park at Pu'uhu Nua'o Ha Now Now and avoid the $20 fee. There's also some parking right at Hanano Bay, but it is a five minute walk and locals charge $5. And you'll have to pay per individual to get to the park on foot anyway. Pu'u Ho Nua'o Hao Nao Nao is a reconstruction of a Hawaiian temple. The landscape is supposed to look like Hawaii as it was before colonization. The site was once a sacred refuge site. Hawaiians who broke kapu or ancient laws could come here to avoid certain death. You must be respectful in this area because it's considered a sacred site and it's the resting grounds of 23 former Ka'ave chiefs. You can view the sacred landscape as a self-guided tour here. Be sure to pick up a map from the entrance. You can see the ancient royal canoe landing as well as a reconstruction of buildings and tools that were once used. And you can even play a game of Kanane, an ancient strategy game, but make sure you pick up the rules at the visitor's entrance. Next, pop over to Hanano Bay. Some people have said Hanano Bay has some of the best snorkeling in Hawaii. There's clear water, a big healthy coral reef, and tons of marine life. But be careful if you decide to snorkel here. There are thousands of sea urchins and every single rock pit ready to stab you. I also saw a few eels while I was in the water and you have to be mindful of spinner dolphins as well. I found the best way to enter the water was from the center of the lava rocks or what's called two-step. I followed the rocks out to the center and then slightly to the left, there was a little step you could just sit down on and push yourself into the open water. On the edges, I was too scared of the sea urchin and I did see a few people bleeding after getting stabbed by rocks and sea urchin. There's also a small sandy beach area and a boat ramp to the left that people were using to enter the water as well. After Hanano Bay, and if you're still feeling adventurous, you can head over to Kukio Beach or Kakakakai State Park. Both have showers, restrooms, and white stand. Kakakakai State Park was very busy when I went. There were many tourists and locals. Parking wasn't difficult for me, but it was a little difficult to find a good spot on the beach. But I still enjoyed the park and I snorkeled here and was able to see some marine life, though there wasn't as much as what was in Hanano. Bay. North Beach and Kukio Beach are through the Kukio Golf Resort by the Four Seasons. You'll need to visit the security gate to get access from a guard. 
the guard will then give you a pass and put your name on a visitor's list and then you'll be able to drive to the entrance and get buzzed in. Because of this, the beaches are more secluded. Parking is limited here. I didn't have an issue finding in a spot though. North Beach and Kukio Beach have restrooms, showers, and drinking water. There are no tables, but it has a grassy area for picnics and palms for shade. Kukio Beach has a protected lagoon, so it has calmer waters and a shallow bottom that make it better for kids. As for eats, I would recommend stopping at Real Aloha and Fish Company or Kanaka Kava or both. Real Aloha has good food, good vibes, and the restaurant was very clean. It's a poke shop mostly, and Kanaka Kava has local organic family roots. Day five, Kona Coffee Tours. If you're tired from all the adventures, at least this day will provide you with many caffeine options. There are so many good farms to choose from in Kona. I only had time to visit Mountain Thunder Coffee, but I also hear that Greenwell Farms, Hula Daddy, and Heavenly Hawaiian are great options. Mountain Thunder offers coffee processing tours about every 30 minutes, and you can also go on a self-guided tour of their estate. If you go, say hi to Margie the Coffee Cat for me. If she's around, she is so cute. As for Eats, Island Lava Java is supposed to be good. I didn't have time on my visit, or you could just go to Island Vintage Coffee again. I'm wanting a Hapia Moana bowl. Day six, Akaka Falls State Park, Hii Lave Falls, and Waipio Valley. Akaka Falls State Park is the farthest away from the hotels or about one hour, 30 minutes. I'd make some stops along the way at Hii Lave Falls and Waipio Valley. Akaka Falls State Park charges for entry and parking, and they recommend that you pay ahead of time because of the limited cell phone reception. You can pay ahead of time directly on the official website. The park has an impressive 442 foot waterfall. But one of the tallest waterfalls in Hawaii is the Hii Lave waterfall into the Wapio Valley, which has an impressive 1,450 foot drop. But you'll either need to hike here through the valley or pay for a horseback riding tour. I'd also recommend stopping at Hame Kua Macadamia Nut Company to sample a wide variety of big island macadamias on your way to or from Akaka Falls State Park. As for eats, the Fish in the Hog is a very popular barbecue restaurant in Waimea. I'd also recommend stopping at the Waimea Midweek Farmer's Market if they're open to purchase some local goods and to support the local community. As of this video, they're open on Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Day seven, it's your last day. I'd stop at the Waikola Petroglyph Reserves, which is a must-see if you're interested in the Hawaiian culture. Their images carved into rocks by native Hawaiians a long time ago. Then just maybe enjoy the last moments on the island before departing. Departure. Dropping off the rental car was easy for me. Enterprise had an area where I could just hand an associate the key and then walk to the building to take the shuttle bus to the airport. At the airport, you'll board outside, so you'll have to walk up a large metal staircase with your hand luggage. So that wraps up this video of how I would recommend spending my time if I were going to the Big Island again for the first time. If you've been to the Big Island, drop me a comment below and let me know if you have any recommendations that I didn't mention. I'd also love to get more suggestions for locally owned and native owned businesses to support on my next visit. Again, be sure to visit my website, elisleola.com to get the downloadable itinerary located in the blog post with the same title. The blog post also has more information than what I include in this video. And there are two related posts in the Big Island content series, which includes a brief history of the Big Island and includes climate maps. I'll include the links to this information below in the description. And if you're heading to Big Island, make sure you visit the official Hawaii COVID-19 website for up-to-date travel information. Aloha and thanks for watching.